Welcome back to another FPL video. Today we're going to be discussing my transfer plans going ahead into game week 8 and beyond that as well. Because I have got three free transfers. So there's a lot that I can potentially do. A lot of players that I could be taking out of my team. A lot of players that I could be bringing in. So I'm going to be discussing the best players for me to bring into the side. As well as that, the, bear, the players that I'm thinking about going the other way. The players that I'm thinking of transferring out. If you do enjoy this video, do drop a like on it. It'll be very much appreciated. It takes one second. And please do subscribe to this channel as well if you are new around here because this has got a lot of daily FPL content this channel has. So please do hit subscribe. It takes one second as well and it'd be very much appreciated. Okay then, so we'll give you a run through of the current situation that we're in. We'll start off with the defenders. We want to talk about each player and just think about am I going to be keeping them for the long run? How am I feeling towards this player in terms of transfers? Uh, as you can see... I have got uh, 0 0.1 in the bank and three free transfers going into game week eight. So I'd say we're in quite a nice position off the wild card in game week six. Obviously, a shocking week last week. Uh, shocking week, a shocking week in game week uh, six. Good week in game week seven. That's basically almost all. We've actually got a green arrow overall since we have wild card, which I guess is okay considering how bad the first week was for me and many of the wild carders who especially didn't have a certain Cole Palmer. So um, we'll start off by talking about David Raya. It's disappointing him and Gabriel. You know, both not getting the clean sheets in the last two games against Southampton and Leicester. Two games you'd expect Arsenal to be getting clean sheets. You should have, we at least should have had one clean sheet out of those two games. But uh, for the long run, I think they're going to have to stay in my side. After this Bournemouth game, the fixtures do get a lot tougher for Arsenal. Um, but I'm just going to have to stick with it. I think it's three games where Arsenal have a difficult run. Um, and I think it's they got they got Liverpool in that run. They got Ch they got Chelsea as well. And I just, I'm just going to have to keep hold of David Raya and Gabriel and hope they get clean sheets. Because one thing that we've learned from Arsenal is it doesn't matter who they face, they can get clean sheets. They've got a clean sheet against Spurs, a clean sheet as well against PSG in the Champions League. So I'm happy just to go with the Arsenal defence and just hope for the best pretty much. A lot of it's kind of just hoping for the best really. Jacob Greaves is a player that, I mean, I, there's not really much to discuss about him. I'm not looking to move him on. He's just a four million defender who's fifth defender who's never going to really play for me unless he has a really good fixture or... Um, we have an absolute defensive crisis for injuries. Now, the third player is one that I want to discuss in a bit more detail. It's Trent Alexander-Arnold. So, if I was to move to Cole Palmer, obviously I don't have Cole Palmer in my side. If I was to move to Cole Palmer, a potential route to, to Trent Alexander-Arnold to, to, would be to move Trent, Trent Alexander-Arnold on to a player that we'll talk about in depth just in a second. But yeah, um, Trent Alexander-Arnold would be the player that I'd have to move down just due to the fact that I don't want to downgrade elsewhere. He's the easiest position to move down. And then with the pictures for Liverpool kind of turning as well, not being as easy as what they were in the opening seven games, it does kind of make sense. But there is a but in this because do, do, would it feel a bit silly getting rid of Trent Alexander-Arnold when he, is, he has been very good so far this season? He's not quite got the attacking contributions that he probably deserves, only picking up one contribution. But I do think his second contributions are still very much a possibility despite these hard fixtures. And in addition to that as well, um, Liverpool have been the best defence in the league. There's no denying it. You know they're, they're, Their numbers are really good for XG conceded. Very good per 90 minutes as well. And the, the proof's in the pudding. You know, they've kept five clean sheets out of seven games. So to get rid of a Liverpool defender, would that be silly? But I do think it is probably the, same, the most sensible way to move to Palmer for me. But as I say, I, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to do it this week because I think Liverpool have, have got a good, well, as I say, good defence, and it's not like Chelsea isn't a good isn't a good fixture by any means, but it's not an absolutely terrible fixture. At least they're at home at Anfield, but he is going directly against the man in form, Cole Palmer. So it's do I waste the transfer? Do I do I waste? Do I use a transfer getting rid of Trent? And it's not just that. Obviously, I've got to use multiple transfers. As I say, I have got three transfers, so I could get to quite to Cole Palmer quite easily without taking a hit, but. Is it really worth it when Cole Palmer has got Liverpool away? I'm going to be discussing Cole Palmer a bit more in detail and discussing how I'm going to be moving to him as well, like everything about Cole Palmer. But does it really make sense when I'm transferring him against Liverpool away? It is the most difficult picture, in my opinion, that Cole Palmer's got in his next like five games or even longer than that. But in the, in the short term, this is the toughest fixture. So for me, does it make 100% sense to bring in Cole Palmer and then get rid of Trent and use all them transfers? And then I'm in a position going into future games where I'm low on transfers. My kind of thinking is, do I maybe stack the transfers up and then move to Cole Palmer on a better week, potentially next week? So that's my thought process. But Trent Alexander-Arnold is someone that's definitely could could go, could be leaving my side at some point. But at the same time, I am very happy just to keep hold of him because I think, well, he's been amazing for me so far this season. As I say, Liverpool's defence has been amazing. Despite the fixtures turning, I still think there's points there for Trent Alexander-Arnold. I still think there's clean sheets for Liverpool just based on how they've defended so far. Even in the Champions League as well, they've looked solid as well against tougher teams as well, against Milan 
and um, was it the Bologna in the second game? They've only conceded one goal in those two games, and they're still two decent enough teams as well. So I don't think there's any rush for me to really be pressing the button on Trent Zerardo and moving him on. But let me know what you think of that in the comments. Uh, then, well, you know, we'll go and discuss uh, Eight Nori now. He's a player I'm thinking of bringing him in, bringing in for uh, Trent Zerardo if I was to bring him in. So here we are with Eight Nori. He's already had a lot of transfers in so far this week. It might even be more than thirty thousand transfers in at the moment. That was that I, I did this a while ago, so he might have more transfers in. But at four point four million, um, Wolves' fixtures do turn not this week. They got one more tough game against Man City, but. In the long run, Wolves have a really good fixture run. I do kind of want a Wolves player. And the two Wolves players that I'd be interested in is Eight Nori, who's on your screen, and maybe Cunha up front for Wolves as well as a move for maybe um, someone like a Dominic Slanky we'll discuss in greater detail later on in the video. But um, Eight Nori, as I say, the fixture turn. Brighton, isn't, Brighton away isn't a great fixture, but if you look at uh, Eight Nori's contribution so far this season, the guy's picked up two goals and two assists, four contributions from defence. Obviously... I don't think he'll be able to keep up that level of contribution. But we have seen Eight Nori come in with um, you know, a lot of attacking returns in the past. And with the, with this fixture run for Wolves, it's a potential chance for maybe some clean sheets. Wolves have been absolutely catastrophic defensively, and that might even be an understatement. They have been absolutely woeful defensively. Defensive numbers, awful. XG considered terrible. But um, going forward, they actually have looked pretty good. Um, especially, I was going to say, especially Eight Nori in defence. They've scored a lot of goals, Wolves have. And with the fixtures coming up, I do see goals for them. And clean sheets at that 4.5 million price point, or ever, uh, uh, anyone around there, you know, there's not really any player that's massively stood out that you're like, you have to own. And there's not been a huge amount of clean sheets that have been, you know, to, uh, you know that have been happening in the Premier League so far. As in United, they've been the best defence in terms of keeping the most clean sheets. But I feel like with United, you either, they either concede zero goals or concede like two or three goals. So that's made the defence not look as good. But defensively, United have kept a lot of clean sheets. Wolves, as I say, defensively have been terrible. But it's more for the attacking threat of Aitnor. And he's 4.4 million as well. He's very, very cheap. And for that kind of for a player that's coming in with that many attacking returns, he's not been talked about enough just due to the fact that Wolves have been terrible and the fact that obviously Wolves have got Man City next. Maybe the fact, maybe when he plays Brighton next week and the fixtures do properly turn, it'll be talked about a lot more. But he, for me, is the number one standout transfer in for me. If I was to move Trent on, which I don't think will be this week, as I say, I'm planning to kind of keep hold of Trent. But Eight Nori looks like an amazing player, for an amazing value. And with the fixtures coming up, Wolves, could they keep one or two clean sheets? Potentially, unlikely, but who knows? They have got Southampton in three weeks' time or four weeks' time, which is a nice fixture pass at home as well. It's a nice fixture. If he can just sneak one or two clean sheets in like the next eight game weeks and then come in with one or two attacking returns, you'd say at 4.4 million, that provides excellent value. And it's a good, it's a good, and you know, you never know. He could come in with a game against Southampton or whatever way, could get a contribution and a clean sheet. And you're talking big, bo you're talking bonus points. And then you're talking uh, like massive points haul in general. So Aitno has got the potential to do that. And at 4.4 million, I actually really like him as an option. So going back on to talking about our defence, we're still carrying on now with Rico Lewis. Now, is he guaranteed to start against uh, Wolves? Probably not. Am I going to be probably starting against Wolves? Most likely so. I've got a bit of a benching dilemma going into the next game, which is an, it's always, I mean, it's, it's a good, it's a blessing and a curse that you've got a bench dilemma. You know, you always feel like you made the wrong decision, but then it is good that you have got at least got strength on the bench, which is the positive that you can see in that. So we'll talk about uh, Rico Lewis. Wolves away, it's not, it's a good fixture, but it's not a good fixture. I just think it's a good fixture for Man City in general, but defensively for Man City as a Rico Lewis, is it, a good fixture. Wolves have been pretty good going forward and at Molyneux as well. If it was a home fixture, I'd feel much more confident. But it's not the greatest of fixture, but I still do Batman City for that. And currently, I have got Rico Lewis starting in my team. If he starts, it's a great option. He's got that attacking potential going forward. As I said before, Wolves aren't the best defensively and Rico Lewis can potentially get something going forward like he got against um, in the last game for Man City um, against Fulham, which was a lucky assist, by the way. You know, he just passed the ball to Doku who just, who just absolutely slapped it in the net. But an assist is an assist. And Rico has got potential for more assists going forward. And against Wolves, as I say, nice fixture for Man City. There's definitely goals in that for them. Could Rico Lewis do something going forward? Very much so. If he is starting, that is. Um, but clean sheet-wise, I'm not massively confident. But it is Man City. You feel like Man City don't concede a lot of chances, which they don't. Against Fulham defensively, they were absolutely terrible, to be honest. And without Rodri, they don't look the same. So I'm not I'm not really confident in a clean sheet. If I was to say it, I'd be more confident in an Ola clean sheet against Crystal Palace at home than I would against Rico, than I would Rico Lewis against Wolves. 
So I'm, only, I'm honestly quite torn between the decision on who to start. Obviously, I'm going to be starting Gabriel, and I can't not start Trent. Then it's between Rico Lewis and Aina. And as I say, Nottingham Forest, again, putting up a really good performance against Chelsea. Um, they, they considered a few chances towards the end. Um, Chelsea could have potentially got a goal at the end. But for the for, in general, for the 80, 85 minutes, whatever, Nottingham Forest, again, were rock solid at the back, like they were at Anfield, like they have been for the majority of this season, to be honest. So Aina, I don't mind starting him against Crystal Palace. So it's a bit of a tough decision. I've got a bit of a... But I've got a bit of a tough decision between those two. But both of those two, as, tra as far as transfers out or anything like that, there's no need for me to transfer them out. They'll stay in my team. I've got more pressing issues than Rico Lewis and Aina, even if Rico Lewis, say, doesn't start against Wolves. Because I do think he'll start the majority of them games in Man City because, um, you know, he's been on the pitch at the same time that Kyle Walker's been on the pitch. He's slotted in at right back. He's also played in centre mid as well. There's, I just think Rico Lewis has been quite a key part to the way that Man City have played so far this season, which is quite it's good to see as a Rico Lewis owner. And at 4.7 million, there's no denying that he's a great option at that price. If he's starting, even if he starts four of the next five game weeks, there's no denying he's a great option just due to that attacking threat that he's got and defensively. I mean, Man City aren't the best defensively, yes, but they are still what are they still they're still one of if not the best team in the league there's no doubt about that so now moving on to the midfield and we'll talk about uh the transfer in the potential transfer in in a second but we'll start off with Bakayo Saka and a, a potential thing is could I maybe could you maybe go after this week when the fixtures change a bit for out for three games could you potentially go Bakayo Saka out to Cole Palmer as just a simple transfer the simple answer to that for me is no I just think own the, I'm just think the best thing is for me the way forward is just to just own them both to be honest, and just don't even think about it. Because, uh, so, uh, say I got rid of Bakaya Saka after this week for Cole Palmer, the fixtures change again for Saka, then I'm going to have to do the same transfers and get Saka back in anyway, because when the fixture run changes for Arsenal, in like, I think it's game, in like game week 12, I, wa I want Saka, there's no doubt about it, I absolutely want Saka, and I want probably a triple up on Arsenal, which I've got. So for me, just moving them on, to then bring them back for me, I just don't want to be messing about with transfers. And, there's, and as I say, in the three fixtures that Saka's got, which is tough, there's absolutely, there's absolutely, you know, I just don't think there's any chance of Saka like blanking in all three of them games. Like there's a very high chance that Saka will still return in the tougher games. He's been so consistent for Arsenal for a number of years now and especially this season. His attacking output's been ridiculous. So there's just no need for me to even consider moving Saka on. There's no way I'd get rid of him in the slightest. He's pretty much a season keeper at this point for me. Morgan Rodgers is another player that I don't really need to discuss in too much great detail. He disappointed against United to be honest. I thought it was a... Pretty poor performance from him. I think he's maybe looked a little bit tired just due to the amount of minutes he's been playing. But now it's the international break. He is playing for the England's 21s, I believe. But um, I'm sure he'll be fully rested and ready to go against Fulham. So no way I'll be getting rid of him. I've got value in Morgan Rodgers as well. And I just wouldn't be transferring him out anytime soon. Semenya is an interesting one. Now, if I was to do a three transfer move to bring in Cole Palmer, the move would be Luis Diaz out to Cole Palmer in. That's, that we'll discuss Luis Diaz in more detail in a minute when we get to him. It'll be Luis Diaz out for Cole Palmer in. It'll be Trent Alexander-Arnold down to eight Nori. And then the other move that I'd do would be, just to absolutely confirm the fact that I can, I can afford the transfers, because I'd be very close to affording that. I'd do Semenyo out and bring him down then to like a Tyler Dibbling at six, uh, 4.6 million for Southampton. But Semenyo's got a nice fixture run. After these next three games, he's got Arsenal next, which is hard. Then he's got Villa, which is another difficult fixture. But I, don't, I wouldn't mind playing him against Villa, by the way. And then Man City at home, which again, I wouldn't even be too mad playing against Semenyo given Man City's, you know, defensive record this season and even in previous seasons. So I don't mind Semenyo, but if I was to get Palmer to really be able to afford him, it would have to be Semenyo who I'd have to sacrifice to go down to Tyler Dibblin. But after that, as I say, from game week uh, 11 onwards, I think it is, um, that's where uh, Bournemouth's fixtures are actually really good again for quite a while. So I can get him rid of Semenyo, I do kind of have a few reservations on getting rid of him, but he is a transfer out if I wanted to get to Cole He'd be one of the players I'd have to get rid of just because I don't think, I think I'd be like 0.1 off affording Cole Palmer if I did, um, say, just Alisson Arnold down to 8 Nori and then Luis Diaz up to, Palm, up to Palmer. I wouldn't be able to afford it. I'd be literally 0.1 off. So for that, I'd have to downgrade to Menyo and that, an easy downgrade is Tyler Dibbling. Then I've got an extra bit of money to spend elsewhere, potentially on the defence or forward. We'll talk about the forwards in a second because this is another transfer plan that I'm thinking of as well getting rid of because there is a kind of a fixture string for one of my strikers which again definitely is up for conversation it's something that i really need to give a big thought a lot of thought into going into next game week so Semenyo is one that i really would ideally like to keep hold of just because of them fixtures from game week 11 onwards as i say really good fixture run for bournemouth and Semenyo has looked good so far this season he's he's keeps you know he's still right at the top of shots uh, out of any midfielders 
and his XG, his XGI is still really good. His numbers are still really good. And he's so influential for Bournemouth, just watching him as well. And he's such a good player. He hasn't quite got the bonus points so far this season, which is something that he needs to add to his game, hopefully, that comes with um, his, in, his next few performance, in, in his next few performances, when I start him anyway. Um, but yeah, definitely to many, I'm really happy with. I've had him since game week three, and he's been amazing for me, to be honest. Uh, then we have Embuemo. I don't really discuss him in detail. Brentford's fixture is still good in, in the short term as well. And there's just no way I'd get rid of Embuemo. If you don't own Embuemo, I have serious questions for you because he is... He's like he's just so highly owned, and he's he's not essential, of course. There's never not really any player that I'd say is too essential, but honestly, he is in the top bracket of players that you'd say is essential at this stage in FPL. You know, he's literally rivaling players like in terms of essential. He's as, he's as essential as a Saka, in my opinion, and he's an essential as a Pat Cole Palmer at the moment, in my opinion. Maybe Cole Palmer is slightly above him, but Embuemo is definitely not far away from him, in my opinion. Now we need to discuss Luis Diaz. It's an interesting one. A lot of people are obviously thinking, will he start against Chelsea? A lot of people have already moved him on. And a lot of people have been very frustrated owning him, especially the fact if you've gone from Jota to Luis Diaz. Very, very frustrating. Now, it's the international break. They get two weeks break. Obviously, he'll be playing for Colombia in um, in the international break. And Gakpo, who is his competition, will be playing uh, for the Netherlands in their international break as well. So, um, there's no, no worries about Luis Diaz. I think his last game is on Tuesday before the international break. So, he'll be back and he'll be ready to go for Chelsea, which I believe is probably it's probably on a Sunday game. I'm not sure on the day. But either way, he's back in England and he'll be absolutely fine for the game. And I think Liverpool will put out their strongest starting eleven. There's no reason why they won't against Chelsea. And for me, Luis Diaz is still a part of the strongest starting eleven for Liverpool. So in my personal opinion, I think that Luis Diaz will start against Chelsea. Obviously, the 90 minutes question, I don't think he'll be getting 90 minutes. But if, if he's starting, he's playing 60, 70 minutes. I'm honestly happy to keep hold of him for another week because I still think Liverpool will get goals against Chelsea. And Luis Diaz has been so influential whenever he started for Liverpool so far this season. There's been a, rarely a game where he hasn't done a lot. Against Wolves, he was pretty poor, to be honest. But other than that, he's impressed pretty much in every single game. And I do think he'll be in the starting eleven against Chelsea. So I'm just thinking, do I hold Luis Diaz for one more week? See how he gets on. You never know, he might do well against Chelsea. And then he has got Arsenal after that. But, um, you know, it's just thinking, just think, keep him for one more week and then make my decision in a week's time when I've got an extra transfer and a fourth transfer then. I'd be sat in such a nice position. Then if you look at it and Luis Diaz does start against Chelsea and does well and gets a contribution or whatever, you'd be saying you're in a really nice position if that can happen. Obviously, maybe I'm dreaming a little bit, but let me know in the comments, do you think Luis Diaz will start? If I was to say it, as I say, first game back from the international break, I do think Luis Diaz will start. I know I know, Arnie Slot has said before that the last international break, he wanted to start Gakpo at the start of the international break, but uh, apparently Luis Diaz came back fitter than Gakpo or something. So he started Luis Diaz and then Luis Diaz just continued his form that he showed in the first three matches. So it's obviously not 100% nailed on, but I don't think I'm going to bother using a transfer. I just can't really justify bringing in Cole Palmer against Liverpool. But we'll discuss Cole Palmer in some more detail now. So discussing Cole Palmer, obviously his ownership is so high. 50% half of the game owned him. He's already up in price at 10.8 million. He might even be more than that by the time you see in this video. And um, yeah, the fixtures coming up aren't the best for Chelsea. Now, the Liverpool away fixture, in my opinion, is the toughest fixture in his next five games. He's got, after that, Newcastle at home, which I don't even think is a bad game. United away, I don't think it's a bad game. Arsenal is not the greatest against, but it is a home fixture. And then Leicester away is a nice fixture. So honestly, I do think if you look at it, past that Liverpool game away, that is his hardest fixture in his next five games. And then beyond that, you'd say three of his four fixtures are actually quite good against. Newcastle is a good fixture, I'd say, and I'd say United is a good fixture. Arsenal not so much, and Leicester's a good fixture. So then you can say it's actually not a terrible fixture run. And for me, that's more justifiable to bring in Cole Palmer ahead of that game. Now, I'm not saying he can't do anything against Newca against Liverpool because he absolutely can return against Liverpool. I wouldn't even be surprised. But for me, bringing in a transfer, I've got to do like multiple moves to do this as well. You know, I've got to get rid of Trent, which I don't even know if I want to get rid of him yet. I've then got to get rid of a Semenyo down to somebody else down to Tyler Dibble and whatever, just to then get Cole Palmer, who is who hasn't even got a fixture where I wouldn't even consider captain him or anything like that. For me, I think it just makes sense just to roll the transfer and then I'm a transfer up and I've got more knowledge and I've got a better fixture run for Cole Palmer and then I can make my decision from there. And then I've also, as I've discussed my forwards in a second, I've got some plans and forwards as well. But that's my thought process behind Cole Palmer right now. For my, for my team personally and me using all my transfers, is it worth it to do it ahead of a Liverpool away fixture, which on paper is the toughest fixture right now, other than that maybe Arsenal away, but it's, it's top three toughest fixtures, you'd say, for a player Liverpool away at Anfield. So does it, make me, does it make sense for me to bring in Cole Palmer? 
probably not that much. But as I say, I could get punished so heavily for it. But it's, it's a risk that I'm willing to take and go without it. But let me know what you think of that risk in the comments. Now, moving on to the forwards that we want to talk about. We'll talk about Dominic Solanke first. This is the one where I'm questioning right now. Because Dominic Solanke, has, he's been decent in the last few weeks. He's not been anything to write home about. He's picked up returns, like three returns in his last three weeks, I believe. And the fixtures are nice, I suppose, coming up. So in the short term, there's no way I'm getting rid of Dominic Solanke. If I was to say who's the best asset for Spurs out of the attacking assets... I'd honestly say it's Brendan Johnson right now based on value and based on, you know, the player that gets into the most goal-scoring positions. That's not to say Solanke's a bad option at 7.5 million and he could do very well in the next few weeks. So Solanke's someone that's going to be staying in my team 100% in the next few weeks. But beyond that, I think game week 12 is where Spurs' fixtures turn and they're not quite as good as what they, what they are right now. And that is where I could potentially go for a different transfer in and maybe downgrade a Dominic Solanke to a... Maybe a Raul Jimenez if he's still in the team by then. Uh, a Liam Delap if he's still doing well. A Calvert-Loon potentially, probably not though. But someone around that kind of price point at 5.5 to 6 million. And that frees up then another 1.5, 2 million, whatever. To then maybe move again to Cole Palmer. That can fund my transfer a lot easier to Cole Palmer as well. And then I could only then, maybe then maybe I could downgrade a Trent to um, as just a 6 million defender in Guardiola or someone. I don't know, but I'll be like a Solanke move down is definitely on the cards. And as I say, the fixtures for Spurs beyond well, looking at any further in the short term isn't too great. And I'm not 100% sure on, on Solanke. It's just the positions that he's getting into. He's not quite looking as dangerous as what I thought he would. He's kind of playing a Harry Kane role, but he's nowhere near as good as Harry Kane. He's playing a Harry Kane role in terms of the Spurs like to play with the wide players kind of running forward and then the striker dropping in and then playing balls in behind and playing balls like you saw with the Brennan Johnson goal. Brennan Johnson coming in at the back post and that the wingers seem to be more threatening in terms of output, in terms of goals than a Solanke, which is a little bit concerning. But there's not, not to say that Solanke is a bad option because his XG in the last few games has still been really good and he's still created chances uh, as well as had chances himself. So he's a good option 100%, but it's just someone that's maybe not safe in my team for the long term. But in the short term, for the next couple of weeks at least, he's absolutely fine in my team. Erling Haaland, I don't need to discuss him. He'll be my captain this week. And, you know, fantastic option. And against Wolves away, is a great fixture. Chris Wood, I'm really happy with at 6 million. He's, he is just like a boring FPL option. But he chips in with goals every every now and then. And the reason why I picked him last, uh, why I picked him on a wild card ahead of a Dominic Calvert-Loon, I was pretty split between the two. But I just look at it and then Chris Wood last season scored 14 goals. And, like, he puts up consistent numbers. And you don't need to worry about him in terms of Forrest didn't really sign a striker. So he is going to start the game. He's going to play 70, 80 minutes or whatever. And he just comes in with consistent goals. Not like anything special or anything, but at 6.1 million, you can't expect the world. And he comes in with a goal every two or three games or whatever. That's absolutely fine in my FPL team. So that's the team situation. As I say, the plan is to eventually maybe go for Cole Palmer. Probably not this week. The plan is to maybe roll the transfer. But I hope you enjoyed the kind of discussing of what players, what where I am with what players there are in my team and the kind of the transfer plans beyond game week and um, beyond, beyond game week eight as well. You know, looking at the potential for transfers in the future. So let me know what you think of the team in the comment section down below. Got a nice green arrow last week, hoping for a big green arrow again this week. So thank you very much for watching. Drop a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you are new around here. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.